if you're looking at scale, when you have hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands pieces of code or infrastructure running in your production cloud environment, which looks different than your development, than your staging, than your QA, and you have to predict for each of them, it creates a humanly impossible task to achieve cloud efficiency. This is DevOps Paradox, episode number 172. Dynamically manage cloud costs with Zesty. Welcome to DevOps Paradox. This is a podcast about random stuff in which we, Darren and Victor, pretend we know what we're talking about. Most of the time, we mask our ignorance by putting the word DevOps everywhere we can and mix it with random buzzwords like Kubernetes, serverless, CICD, team productivity, islands of happiness, and other fancy expressions that make us sound like we know what we're doing. Occasionally, we invite guests who do know something, but we do not do that often since they might make us look incompetent. The truth is out there, and there is no way we are going to find it. P.S. It's Darren reading this text and feeling embarrassed that Victor made me do it. Here are your hosts, Darren Pope and Victor Farson. When we sit down to write our code, we know exactly how that's going to be running in production, right, Victor? I have no idea. Wait, of course you do. You put it in a container, you put it inside of somewhere, and you know exactly how much it's going to cost you month over month. So there are two options over there, right? One is that I have no idea, and I should know. I should know how to set up the amount of memory, the CPU, disk drive, and stuff like that. And I have no, I, nobody can know that in advance. That's, that's simply impossible. And then there is a potential to use one of the services that actually change those values, figure out those things, and modify my application at runtime to accommodate the changes in something. Let's say traffic. Well, on today's show, we have Maxime on from Zesty. Maxime, how are you doing today? Thank you so much for having me, and I'm doing great. Good. And we're talking about this because this is one of the things that Maxime loves to talk about, is trying to figure out, as a developer, let's think about this for a moment. Let's, let's take it and make it even more absurd. I am a brand new developer out of university working at big company enterprise X and I'm expected to know how big and how much money my application is actually going to cost to run. Come on again, that that's completely absurd, right? But a lot of companies might be expecting that. What do you think, Maxine? It's more complicated than that because your code is your code, but the users of your code is actually, in most cases, are your customers. And your customers have a direct correlation between how much infrastructure they would need in order for you to provide the service they expect. And in a way, if, you're, if this code is running in production, it's being used by the customers of your own business. So the infrastructure is aimed to support their needs. So when you're writing a code and deploying it, you need to kind of be able to have a source of prediction to what capacity your customers will be consuming your application at any given time and mold that prediction into reality. Now, it leads to two side effects. If you got things right, that's amazing. That right is not 24-7 right. During that time, your right would change because you have different times, different customers, different use cases. Your customers most likely in different industries, so you might have seasonalities. And the whole reason you went to the cloud is actually to have an unlimited access to infrastructure. So you would never run out of space. You would always have space for your business to scale. With that reality, the cloud providers are 
requiring required by you to allocate your you the infrastructure. So you have to tell them how how much you need to take, and they would allocate that for you. So if you're going down to that developer who just graduated, he needs to be the one predicting and requesting allocation of an infrastructure unit in CPU, RAM, an amount of blocks in in quantity and for a specific duration of time because duration also has a financial impact. If you get everything right, well, you're at an unbelievable percentile. The vast majority do not have it right all the time. And the wrong leads to two results. Results number Result number one, your requested capacity is just not enough. And you have an impact on your customer experience. Your application may be a bit laggy and it may crash or your business would not get the data it, sh- it is required at the same, at the given time. To cope with that and to overcome that challenge, infrastructure monitoring tools are here to give you alerts and provide your recommendations ahead of the crash so you can ask for additional infrastructure. But that is a manual process. The flip side of that coin is that when you're overinflated, you're actually paying for a lot of reserved capacity or allocated capacity that you're not utilizing. And at that point, and especially in, in our days, you are required and requested to readjust, re, re, rethink, and reallocate your resources to save money and increase your infrastructure efficiency. Now, that task may sound quite simple, but if you're looking at scale, when you have hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands pieces of code or infrastructure running in your production cloud environment, which looks different than your development, than your staging, than your QA, and you have to predict for each of them, it creates a humanly impossible task to achieve cloud efficiency. So effectively, I'm, I'm guessing you're, you're talking about vertical and horizontal scalers, right? As being, uh, being a thing, as, as if they, they're reading those notifications to simplify it, not humans, right? Yes. But the vertical and horizontal scaling happens on that piece of infrastructure you have requested. If you ask five CPUs, four RAMs, it would multiply on that level. How efficient is that setup? How efficient is your request for block storage? How efficient is your request for your IOPS? Yeah, I was about to ask you the same because uh, I, I have a feeling that some things are in better shape, generally speaking, than others. Requesting uh, additional servers to accommodate applications that scale that are in pending state is kind of to different degrees working. Let's say Carpenter in AWS is doing a decent job, right? But storage is mostly uh, static in a way, right? But when you attach something, that's what you got. Forever and ever, right? Forever and ever. And it's not only what you have attached. Let's, Let's talk about another vertical that we have to consider. The newer more advanced, more efficient technologies that are released by the cloud providers. So if you are using, let's, if we were talking, uh, if we're talking AWS lingo, if we're using GP2 as your storage or IO1, just by migrating to GP3 or IO2, you would save between 20 to 25%. You would get more resources by 25% for the same dollar you're paying. Not to talk about the low efficiency that you currently have. So it's it manual efforts, manual work, repetitive guesstimation processes that are added on top of your, in a way, overwhelming day-to-day as a developer, as an infrastructure manager, So you have to do more and you have to think more and you have to react faster. And I I believe that this is is a, a pain that 
we saw when we had our day jobs and we still seeing from our customers. And the only question is like, how can you predict that? How can you predict the duration of your uptime for your server? How can you predict for how many servers you can commit? How can you predict the IOPS your, your application would use at any given time or the amount of block storage? And the answer is, well, you know, we did this and it worked, so we're going to keep doing that up until it fails and then we'll rethink. In a world when you have unlimited options and unlimited infrastructure, what you need is ha to have better prediction and a capability of taking decisions that would prioritize customer experience and cost. What are some of the common ways that people can use to help determine efficiency? I would say utilization. But define utilization just because I'm using 25 EC2 instances, that doesn't mean they're being properly utilized. Awesome. So I think that it's part of the solutions that are given by the cloud infrastructure monitoring teams uh, or products is that they would look at your infrastructure and they would look at the amount of data or the amount of load it's being currently loaded with. And they would say, well, if you're, you have requested to allocate this amount of capacity, but what you're currently using is 10% of it. So your efficiency is 10% or 15% or 17% because you have requested to allocate a plane, but you have one, uh, one passenger. You're paying for the plane and you can have a really quick way to understand your, your utilization by running a query in, within all the infrastructure monitoring tools saying, hey, how much I have, have allocated versus how much I have in use. And once you run that query, it's like, huh. And if you convert that utilization into a monetary value, at that point, if you are quite of a large company, it should ring some bells. Like, why do we need so much? And there is a perfectly good explanation of why our efficiency is so low. Because at some point, in some use case, you needed more. And at that point, your brave engineer, your brave DevOps went and saved the day and asked for just a bit more infrastructure. But to avoid to having saved the day again, he just took that new variable and made it as, as a new standard to make sure it would never happen again. Because, you know, Murphy laws, it will always happen at the worst time. Your 4th of July, your, your, your child's birthday or the middle of the night. So effectively, it sounds like the problem you're talking about is in a way with companies that went from on-prem to cloud and translated their operational handbook to basically essentially do the same, right? Hey, I need to, I need to allocate a server. I need to know how many servers I have. And when I scale up, I will never scale down because, you know, if it's on-prem, why would I scale down? It's my server. I purchased it. I'm not throwing it out of the window, right? Am I, am I right if I say that it's less about technology? Because we have technology to scale down from the example that you said, kind of like, hey, you requested more, but now you need less. No, uh, Victor, is it, what, is, what is the technology to scale in storage? Yes, the story, I mean, Ceph, for example, right? Ceph would give you some kind of distributed storage that will, uh, th that will dynamically increase and decrease, let's say, with Rook the amount of uh, storage you're having, right? Kind of combine all the uh, block storages or whatever you are, you're, you're using as one big blob. Uh, but you're right. I, I believe that storage is probably the least effectively used type of infrastructure. People, are, people want to drive attached to their application, right? Or their server. Uh, so I, I was more commenting in general. Uh, number of servers, uh, memory CPU, uh, that's largely solved. Storage, uh, uh, 
I, I, I myself, I'm not still convinced 100% that we are all going to use this or that yet. And then most of the customers that I, companies that I see are going not for a third party solution that will manage their storage, but for, uh, hey, I'm going to attach EBS volume to something. Amazing. That's, that's exactly, I think, what we are doing better. We are able to manage your EBS volumes. We're not taking your data. We are just doing something simple. We're saying, if I was you, if I were you, if I would have unlimited resources, would I ask for more storage at this point? If the answer is yes, I'll do that. If at this specific point, I would see that the amount of data that my current EBS volume has is in, insignificant and I'm using a five terabyte disk, why should I not give it back to AWS or pieces of that and stop paying for that? The same goes with IOPS. And if I'm zooming out a bit to the world of servers that you mentioned, there is an auto scaling groups that behave according to your customer demand. But once you get to a point where you need to increase efficiency on or actually get a higher ROI on those servers, there is a concept of buying a commitment for a usage of a server. And buying that commitment does not change your server, does not change the way you run your application. It just makes you have the cloud provider preserve that capacity for you. In, re in return for that ask, you are getting uh, a significant discount that can get to 65, 67%. It's just a matter of, well, I think that I can use that server for X period of months. And at that point where we're coming and saying, this is another aspect of prediction. This is another aspect of manual operation. Why are you still doing that? Why are your, you as an engineer have to predict the sizes the the machines and the durations of your allocated capacity why not to have a computer do that on your behalf oh yeah when an engineer predicts capacity i mean whenever i had to predict capacity but as engineer my prediction is always going to be triple of what i need just in case and in reality, you're absolutely right. Based on the reports we see from our internal uh, systems and fro through queries and through our partners, the overall utilization is around 25%. So we should eliminate humans from making those types of decisions in a way. We should empower humans with a solution that does one thing better, that is able to predict more accurate and take decisions faster. Because at the end of the day, as an engineers, our goal is to develop, to think, to build, to build, to grow, not to predict a behavior of consumption of this and that specific element. And I believe that we are good at a lot of things. Prediction, mm, I would leave that to a computer. And real-time decision-making. Well, it's humanly impossible to process all this data that comes in from all different sources. They will... I want to do this here. I want to do that now because for a, for a mistake of missing a critical error, there is a huge price. And that's why you as an engineer and I'm as an engineer would always prefer to take a fat, big buffer saying, well, I want to make sure that my application is able to pass a storm rather than to firefight it. So we are building a mechanisms of defense. While if you have a more, uh, a more, advanced and faster prediction, your buffers can be smaller. And this leads to the Darren's question about what's efficiency. So efficiency is, is the ability to calculate and maintain a safe, a safe enough buffer that will maintain the customer experience intact at any given time and would keep that buffer as close as possible 
for the longest possible duration across different uh, different verticals. The interesting part is what you mentioned before about purchasing from cloud providers things in advance, servers or storage or whatever, right? Because I'm guessing, and cor- please correct me if I'm wrong, there are kind of two types of pre- uh, predictions, like short-term runtime predictions. In 15 minutes, I will have to do this, mm-hmm. whatever that is, increase mm-hmm. the capacity of X, right? Mm-hmm. And my brain is kind of... Uh, can can imagine how that would work. But then there is that prediction about contractual prediction in a way, right? If I'm going to make a deal with Amazon that I'm going to have, I don't know, X servers or X gigabytes of storage because I'm going to get the discount you mentioned, mm-hmm. I'm effectively talking about a year-long prediction, maybe even longer. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of tough. Mm-hmm. I imagine that being more complicated than, oh, I need to increase the capacity right now. Exactly, exactly. Because you, when, when you're taking a long-term commitment, the amount of feedback you need to get is a lot. You have to get an understanding of that environment, who that environment serves. Is that your production? Is that your testing? Is that your data science or is that your uh, development? Once you understand who owns that piece, you would start to have to ask questions of how long we are planning to keep that server up or what that server is doing. And the, the process of exploring and understanding is a long process. To cope with that, companies and tools such as cloud health cloud ability would analyze and give you reports that are based on recommendations based on the data they have gathered required assembled at the end of the day that report is given to either the finance personnel or your vpr and the head of cloud infrastructure and it needs to validate that report versus another report versus another task versus a report that he gets from his infrastructure monitoring tool versus a CISO. So he has to prioritize which aspects he would address and to what capacity. What we see in average is that there is, with mature companies, there is an understanding of a specific baseline where companies feel comfortable of making a commitment on usage what the extra play is that the uncertainty and for that specific uncertainty aws being a customer centric company said well you can actually cover that as well and if you make a mistake you can go and send set your commitment on the secondary marketplace or if you have a workload that will be running three or four months, which is not a standard contract, you can go to the secondary marketplace and you can purchase a commit for for that specific server for that specific duration to save costs. But again, it requires an understanding, a resource allocated for that, that it's his responsibility to manually predict and follow up on those actions as I just described. Again, additional resources are required to achieve cloud efficiency additional manpower we're saying why we have computers let's have computers do that it's it's a simple task you need to predict you need to build a model and once you understand that that's the model you trust that model let it run it seems like in what you're explaining here the old model, if you will, to where finance controls the amount of resources you use, which seems insane to me, but I know it's they, true. No, they have an impact. They do not control, but they do have an impact. Okay, fair enough. But it seems silly that finance needs to have any kind of comment on anything other than saying, here's your budget, because there should be no humans actively involved in determining the cost based on what we've been talking about. It seems like all of this should just be true real-time analysis of what's our current load, and load is a big 
loaded word, not to make a joke, feeding all of that data. Because at, as an operations person, I would go in, take a look at the console, and, okay, what CPU pressure am I under? What memory pressure am I under? Okay, let's size that up. Let's, auto, you know, using the autoscaler, throw in a few extra instances, whatever the case is. This is all before Kubernetes, but th the argument is still the same. But now it's like, why even bot? I mean, yes, that skill needs to still exist because sometimes machines may get it wrong. So we need the human to come up with the creative ways to then tell the machines what to do in the future. Right. And I'm assuming that's a lot of the models of what Zesty has done is, okay, we have all of this data. This was predictive model one. And then more data came in, more humans were involved in making decisions. So that was then predictive model two. And, or, and I'm using my words for not what Zesty uses. Can you see a point in the future to where other than using humans for creative, the creative ideas and trying to catch on the new things to where it's just going to be computers driving all the other computers from a financial perspective? Uh, I would say not exactly. You have, in a way, different service levels that you are required, wish, and obligated to give to your customers. Because at the end of the day, if you like, if you have to look at the production piece of your infrastructure, that production piece is catering to your customers. Now, your customers, you have, let's assume you have multiple customer verticals with multiple customer tiers using multiple products. Some customers on some products would want to have a different SLA than others. And this is a purely business decision, what you want to run and how to achieve that SLA. So it's purely a manual decision. It's a purely business decision. If you are a financing company that is required to have, I would say 100% SLA uptime and versus you are a web scraping company where you can compromise for a lower SLA, those SLAs have price. And at the end of the day, it's up to the business to decide which kind of SLA he wants to give what for what kind of product line for what type of a customer. And from that point on, yes, I believe that we should have computers ach striving to achieve that SLA within the, within the set price that was set by the business. So basically, at some point, we should be able to determine what our floor is. We should know what our minimum spend mm -hmm. is always. And that way, I don't have to go to that secondary market. I would have my own reserved instances for one year, three year, whatever it might be. It doesn't, doesn't really matter, whatever our risk tolerance is. And I imagine that's another thing. But going back to what you were just saying as you started up, you were saying multiple X, multiple Y, multiple Z. We're doing good to even get to X, much less multiple X as a developer, because we're just thinking, well, I'm just writing this one code. It's you know, this one little piece of code. It's going to be in this one little container. I don't know how it's going to be used. And that's the thing. Most developers do not know how their code is going to be used. They have an idea because they had a business requirement document, but that's not reality. And the business requirement document does not have a, a, a direct indi a, a direct understanding of how the business would consume that application at scale. So what we're saying is it's all a, it's all a lost cause, right? It's in a way a lost cause because when you're setting your floor, right? So your floor is one server, let's assume, right? And you launched an amazing app that has tremendous consumption and you have to cater to that consumption. And right now your floor is at seven servers. And that's your seasonality. So would you keep your floor at one or would you raise your floor to seven? Or you believe that seven is, is a new floor that will go from seven to 20 or it will drop back to three. And if it will drop back to three, then when? In a month, in a week, in a quarter, in two years, never? These are easy questions to answer, aren't they? <laughs> Uh, listen, if 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 it, if those were easy answers, most likely Zesty would not be as successful as we are. 
So let's talk about what Zesty has to offer. So Zesty came to the world with the following statement. In order to build prediction, you need to rely on tremendous amounts of data that is streamed to you in real time. That was the initial statement. Once we started getting data, we understood that a lot of the resources, a lot of the processes that are done manually can be automated. And the reason we feel comfortable with automation is the more data you have, the more accurate your prediction is, and the, the more comfortable you feel with automating specific activities. We started with a solution that we call a commitment manager, where we are able to predict you as, a, as an individual company, or oh, sorry, a prediction of your one server as a piece of a few servers within one company to correlate that with usage of another server for a different company within the same space or a different space with the liquidity of the marketplace. So it, we have, we factor in multiple variables and based on those variables, our algorithm makes a decision on your behalf to buy a commitment. And we're so sure in our algorithm that we are giving a commitment that if we're losing money, we're going to compensate you, right? So it's because we have prediction on multiple variables that we know when the commitment that was bought by Zesty is no longer utilized, we are guaranteed to liquidate that on your behalf. Our prediction is spread across multiple elements. That was the first piece of the puzzle. With that, we're saving companies on time predicting that floor and are able to maximize their savings with the constantly changing ceiling effect. If your company, let's say if you're within uh, a shared riding, so during the day you have peaks, during the night you have lows. You have different floors. If you're in, uh, in travel tech, you have seasonalities. There are different variables that impact vertical to vertical. You as an individual, you're living with your own environment. Zesty looks at you as part of one pillar with an entire ecosystem. That enables us to automate things on your behalf. We took that real-time data and we understood that additional frustration comes from low utilization of storage. And we said, well, we can solve that as well. Real-time data, calculating the right buffers, as I mentioned, and trying to ask the cloud provider on your behalf for more infrastructure or give it back. It sounds quite simple, but the amount of data and the amount of, of variables that are factored in with that equation is insane. But things that are done easy are not, are not likely being adopted and as successful. That's based on what I know. I think what's interesting there is you're not just predicting within my four walls of my company, but you're throwing me in a pool with other people. I would imagine not evenly, and it would depend on, am I a new customer to Zesty? If I'm a new customer to Zesty, then obviously you don't have enough data, so you have to rely on that. But I imagine over time, as you see my real live numbers, then the impact of those other anonymized people, I'm, I'm assuming everything's anonymized because I can't see anything, could lessen over time or could it increase? So Darren, if you're a, if you're a new customer to Zesty, right, if you're just on board, uh, you're coming in with historical data, whether you like it or not. There is public data on that your server, your metadata indicates when that server was launched. And there are a lot of data points that we can infuse our algorithm with his, your historical uh, usage, cost and usage reports. Those indicate your behavior. So all that data is being factored in and saying, well, this is Darren, he's new to us, but this is the data he comes in with. It's not real time, but this is this is an historical data with that was taken with this, those intervals. Let's fuel that in. And that helps us to build a quite comfortable and quite accurate profile of who Darren is. 
so from the there historical it's easy. informs. Yeah. From there, it's easy. I'm saying that so you can pull the historical. Mm-hmm. It informs the mm-hmm. model. Mm-hmm. But then, by the time you pile on my my friends, my enemies, whatever else might fit into my vertical or maybe adjacent verticals, because like you were saying, travel is very seasonal, but that's true in different parts of the world because we have the hemispheres. So in Northern hemisphere, it's now summertime, Southern hemisphere, it's winter, but you could take, let's, let's magically say you're working with, I don't know, Singapore airlines. No, they're still Northern hemisphere. What's the one in New Zealand? I can't remember. New Zealand air. I'm making up a new airline right now. So we know what New Zealand air or no. Um, what's the one out of Australia? Come on. The big red kangaroo. Qantas. Qantas. Yeah. So Qantas, we, we can look at Qantas and we can look at, let's say American airlines and I can compare the two, but they're seasonally completely opposite. But that also could help do predictive because things happen in Australia before they get to the States. Yeah. So you could, you you know, whatever I'm making up models now. Darren, I I, I would add a few more uh, interesting pieces to that, to to, to your pile. Right. Uh, So you have the airlines, but add to that a FinTech company and a cyber company and a hedge fund. All those four and all those six are actually using the same servers given by the AWS. Their usage is completely different. Their usage patterns are quite different, but they're using the same resources. At the end of the day, if all those companies use the same resource, we just need to understand how that resource is being used by different companies and to determine, to predict the utilization or or the popularity of that specific resource at any given time, factoring in multiple verticals with multiple companies. Well, all of Maxime's information is going to be down in the show notes. Maxime, thanks for being with us today. Thank you for having me. We hope this episode was helpful to you. If you want to discuss it or ask a question, please reach out to us. Our contact information and a link to the Slack workspace are at devopsparadox.com slash contact. If you subscribe through Apple Podcasts, be sure to leave us a review there. That helps other people discover this podcast. Go sign up right now at devopsparadox.com to receive an email whenever we drop the latest episode. Thank you for listening to DevOps Paradox. Devops Paradox.